So for those who don't know me, I am Ben Pocket. I'm an assistant professor in plant pathology and environmental microbiology. So it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Owen O'Connor. Um, so Owen uh, comes to us from Ireland where he got his PhD at Maynooth University, uh, where he applied a number of different omic techniques, genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics to looking at viral infection of agaricus, which we'll learn quite a bit more about. This is the button mushroom that we're all commonly with or we're familiar with um, uh, to buy mushrooms at the store, for example. So after getting his PhD in 2019, um, is that right? Yeah, yeah. okay, close enough. Um, he had a couple of years that he spent in industry and then in 2022, early 2022, um, we recruited Owen to come join us over here, um, where he's been working on a collaborative project between my lab, John Pecchia's lab, and Carolee Bull's lab, where we're looking at um, uh, communities and how they play into uh, agaricus ice forest cultivation. So I won't say too much more about that, but I also have the honor of presenting um, Owen with the inaugural plaque that we are now giving for internal speakers. Oh, so give me. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and thanks everyone for attending today and those online as well. So uh, as Kevin mentioned, uh, my project is uh, proteomics based and it's in the field of uh, agaric spice forest cultivation, which is a mushroom. And it's a collaborative, collaborative uh, project and my kind of arm of the project is relating to metaproteomics. So I'll go into some detail as to what that is for those who may not be familiar. Uh, and the title of my talk is the metaproteomic profiling of passive microbial communities and agaric spice forest cultivation. So I've kind of broken it down into a few different parts. Um, I'm going to start with a general introduction. So the project as a whole, as I mentioned, it's um, demonstrating and manipulating mushroom devomes. So when we use the word devome, it's just another word for a developmental microbiome. Um, and I'm looking at the um, casing in particular to look at the functional devome. Um, and the reason we're interested in casing, and I'll go into some detail as to what casing is shortly, is casing harbors microorganisms that are really crucial for fruit body formation and uh, initiation in the first place. Um, we ask, can manipulating the devome actually alter the outcome of a crop um, in some positive or even a negative kind of way? Um, and to answer that question, we want to profile community composition within the casing and then also try to understand the functional processes that these microbial communities um, partake in. So for um, the cultivation of agaricus, um, just to explain a little bit more about casing, as that's the main focus of my research at the moment. Uh, casing is a sphagnum peat moss, and it's the top compost layer that goes over the compost. Um, the compost itself actually supplies the nutrients to the uh, mycelium, but the casing has a different function. So it doesn't actually supply any nutrition. However, it is crucial for the crop. Um, it impacts yield, it impacts quality and uniformity across the crop. So poor casing does not uh, translate to a good outcome for um, a crop. Um, the most important physiological property of casing is that it has a high water holding capacity as mushrooms need a lot of water for their growth. Um, it has a porosity, which allows a kind of a gaseous exchange, so a high oxygen environment, um, because as well as lowering temperatures within a crop, uh, the exposure to oxygen is another trigger for uh, vegetative mycelium to uh, kind of transfer into the reproductive growth or the pinning formation, which subsequently becomes mushrooms. And as I mentioned, it harbors bacteria uh, that are crucial for fructification. So pseudomonads in particular are uh, known to be quite important for uh, fructification. Without them in an axanic uh, casing, you don't get mushrooms. And um, one of the reasons towards that is uh, pseudomonads actually metabolize volatiles within uh, the casing itself, which agaricus produces. So it kind of removes those toxic compounds uh, to allow it to uh, uh, produce fruit bodies. Is it, known, is it known whether the microbes are of a compositional requirement for that or can it be any? Um, we know that uh, as the but mushrooms get produced and they grow, we get higher numbers of the likes of pseudomonads, so proteobacteria as a whole, from acuities, um, th things like that. So yeah. in that sense, yes, um, but casing is kind of becoming more of a research focus in 
more recent years, right? Um, a lot of the focus on the microbiome has been based on compost in the past. Okay. Yeah. Um, this illustration was made by my colleague uh, Fabricio Vieira, um, and it's a really nice kind of overview of uh, cropping as a whole. And uh, I won't go into too much detail on it, but just to give an idea of what actually a mushroom crop consists of. So there's the uh, starting ingredients, so the, the plant biomass, so this is typically a wheat straw, um, and that's uh, partially broken down um, in the process. There's also animal waste, so that's typically a chicken or a horse manure, and that kind of supplies, uh, for the most part, the, the, the protein content. Um, and then uh, there's different synthetic additives added as well. So this is all the input for what becomes the compost microbiome. These are mixed and wetted, and once they're wetted, there's high microbial activity and that pasteurization follows. And following mm -hmm. pasteurization, you get uh, the, what we call the phase two mushroom compost. And that's where we can uh, add our mushroom spawn. Once the mushroom spawn is added, it colonizes the compost. And um, at this point, we have the beginning of the spawn run. Once the compost is fully colonized, uh, we then add the casing. So the uh, addition of casing is the beginning of what we call the case run or the case hold. Um, following the addition of casing, then uh, the, we also add a, a casing inoculum as well, and we allow the mycelium to grow into the casing. Temperatures are dropped, um, it hits the surface, and then we get pinning formation around here. So that's the kind of crucial point where we start to see primordial form. And then following primordial formation, then we get each uh, harvest, uh, as we call flush or break. Uh, so this would be the first break, second break, and then third break. And then typically um, uh, growers will go to a third break and then um, the crop will be destroyed. So um, that's the idea behind the cultivation process, uh, just moving into passaging. So, um, the reason we are passaging is we're trying to enrich a certain kind of microbiome into the standard casing microbiome. Uh, the way this is done is casing is collected at the point of pinning. So typically in the um, mushroom research center that or the MRC we have, uh, we'll have experimental tubs. And when you get different tubs that uh, have the kind of optimal pinning, that they're selected and then that material is taken and then it's uh, re inoculated <laughs> into a fresh casing. And it's done at the point of pinning because that's when we believe uh, the most stimulatory um, microorganisms are present uh, and then that can kind of be reintroduced into a fresh substrate. So the idea behind this is going from what would be considered maybe a species rich microbiome of many different taxa and then uh, trying to aim for a more specific microbe enriched microbiome. So the idea inevitably with this type of work would be uh, can we find what's important in the casing uh, that stimulates a positive effect within the crop? And can they be uh, synthetically added to a casing? So create a synthetic casing that kind of um, maps what's happening in passage casing and uh, target microorganisms that are beneficial. Uh, one way that that will be done is using the prospector in the plant pathology department. Uh, as the prospector can isolate single colonies, those single colonies can then be taken and re-inoculated into the uh, casing. That's a bit into the future. Uh, we're kind of working our way up towards that at the moment. So just to give an idea of what we see when we do use passage casing. Uh, so as I mentioned, 10% uh, is uh, added to a 90% standard casing. Um, and then uh, these were uh, carried out into, in the MRC as an experimental crop. And these images are just from the same day um, of that particular crop, where we see that the standard casing, there's no visible pins at this point within uh, these experimental tubs, but these are the equivalent tubs uh, on the exact same day. So clearly a lot of pinning, some of these mushrooms are nearly at the point that they could be picked. Um, and there's a very distinct stimulation of um, this kind of process by using the passage casing. Looking at some of the yield data from this, um, the red bars indicate the standard casing substrate plots um, in terms of yield, which is um, kilogram or kg per meter squared. And then the blue bars indicate the passage casing. So it's just very clear um, evidence. It's a very clear phenotype that there's a stimulation of pinning when we use passage uh, casing. So this is obviously very encouraging because um, speeding up a crop by as much as five days is quite significant. Uh, 
what it results to in yield in the end is still to be determined. Uh, we're seeing that the yield does kind of taper out and equalize between the two. But the fact that we're seeing such a distinct stimulation of growth is interesting and it's what we're really exploring further. I just want to mention quickly, it's not going to be the focus of this talk. We do also look at disease dynamics. Uh, so there's a very common um, uh, commercial pathogen, uh, Pseudomonas thalassi, and it creates a bacterial blotch. Uh, so this is just kind of a, a spotted browning within mushrooms. Um, and uh, the Pseudomonas effectively digest the mushroom down and they can become slimy and just obviously uh, they're not commercial. Um, what we see when we grow these plots um, and we inoculate with blotch at a, a high cell count um, is the standard casing, uh, we see a lot of disease. So like very clearly this should be white, it's not. Um, and you can see it down here as well. Uh, but when we use the passage material, there's actually a distinct suppressive effect um, from these uh, materials versus the standard material. And that's just illustrated in this stacked bar chart as well here, uh, where um, the bars to the right, so the, uh, the blue and dark red is the passage material. And then what should be a dark blue and light red is the standard material. And actually what we see is we had no uh, saleable mushrooms when we inoculated the standard casing. But with the passage casing, there is some level that the actual mushrooms go from a state of being uh, you know, uncommercial uh, to something that could technically be sold. So they're healthy, but there is still a lot of disease present. Um, and that's probably just down to working out the um, intricacies of the actual inoculation itself. But we even see from this work that there is a suppressive effect from these passage materials when it comes to bacterial blotch. We also looked at uh, trichoderma, uh, which is a green mold, so obviously a fungal pathogen within the crop. And we see the adverse effects. So in the passage material, there's actually um, more um, green molds. So there's no real um, qualitative results for this, but we do have very clear images. Um, you can see this kind of uh, ring here where there's just complete inhibition of growth and where the inoculation occurs is, is around this point. So around the point that the uh, trichoderma is inoculated into these plots, we get quite a lot of uh, green mold growth within these plots. You can kind of see it just at the surface here, but it is something that occurs more in the compost. Um, and that's another image there. We can see the green mold on top and that will, uh, in some cases, actually grow onto the mushrooms themselves. But for the most part, it creates an inhibition of growth. And with the standard material, we do still get green mold because it is inoculated in, but you can see it's not as prevalent and you don't get this zone where uh, green mold completely takes over. So, yes. <laughs> Did you say that the green mold inhibits growth? Uh, so the, the green mold, the pathogen itself inhibits growth for agaricus. It, it, it outcompetes, um, yeah. Um, so it outcompetes the growth of the mushrooms and as well as that, it is just a pathogen of the mushroom itself. And yet the passage mushrooms develop faster. Yes. And, and this means that the green mold is not a major problem. Is not a witch, sorry. It's not a major problem since your data suggested that the, uh, the, past. the, the passage material does seem to have a, a promotive effect on the green mold itself, on the growth of the green mold. Yeah. Uh, in the center material, not as much, but it's still prevalent. It's still, it's still, it's, it's kind of, it's hard to illustrate with images because it does kind of occur below the casing. But it is still an issue in the in the standard plots. With so when you count your data for the faster growth under the passive situation, mm -hmm. is does that come from data of colonies or uh, plots that have the green mold, or have you avoided counting those? This was more of an exploration experiment. So while we were carrying out the the standard crop for the passage material, we also uh, created experiments just where we introduced disease because it's okay. not something we've tested before. Uh -huh. So this is kind of the first time we've seen this. Yeah. Uh, it's Definitely something that has to be replicated and uh, and done again. But what, what I will say is um, for as many replicates as we had, I think if I remember correctly, we had nine, six of the nine had this kind of ring effect. Uh, so it was uh, reoccurring in separate plots. Um, but uh, overall, uh, there's definitely a distinct, uh, a difference between standard and passage casing when it comes to green mold. Okay. So in a commercial aspect, it's not positive. But biologically, it's interesting for us that we have this kind of dynamic response, suppression of a bacterial pathogen and promotion of a fungal. I think this is a seminar in itself that we'll probably do in the future. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so this is just going into the proteomics workflow a little bit more now. And this image is just to illustrate how the samples were collected. So um, there was uh, 12 different sample points. There was day zero, which was the source casing material. 
there has been five, 10, first harvest, second harvest, and then the final harvest, which is just a destructive sampling. Um, so from a plot, a uh, core core is used to excise holes from the casing, and then that's done in triplicate. And then that's done um, on each a consecutive time point. In terms of the actual protein extractions themselves, um, uh, this is just kind of an illustration of how they're done. So this is a method I kind of had to build from uh, older methods and kind of tailor more to a casing dynamic and as well to more of a microbiome di dynamic because I've worked with proteomics before, but it's typically targeted to one organism. So for the casing, the cell lysis is done by uh, boiling the material for five minutes. So this is a very destructive process, but it's a way of getting the proteins out of that kind of hard matrix. And it also deactivates proteases. Protease inhibitor cocktail is additionally added. And then a homogenizer is used to just uh, kind of really ensure cell lysis occurs. And uh, there's then a clarification where the supernatant is taken. And then that supernatant can be uh, washed with an with a acetone and then proteins are precipitated with TCA. One of the big problems we're working with something like casing is uh, casing is very high in humic acids and humic acids are a nightmare for any kind of proteomics experiment. Um, for multiple reasons, they um, interfere with the chemistry of proteins and the proteins can bind to humic acids. They co-precipitate with proteins. So even when you precipitate your proteins out, humic acids will co-precipitate. Um, they affect the, um, the mass spec instrument itself. Uh, it affects the electrospray aspect of, of, of the um, mass spec instrument. And it also is difficult to load onto an LC column if it's too high in humic acids. So one of the ways I tried to circumvent this issue was uh, performing an extra step in the workflow where uh, I use a spin filter. So by trypsinizing the polypeptides, then it's peptides using trypsin. Um, these tryptic peptides can then be spun through a spin filter and obviously they'll be in the, uh, uh, in the permeate. As well as that, prior to the spin, you can add a formic acid to acidified samples, which will precipitate uh, humic acids. And then with the 10 kilo Dalton cutoff, uh, this will not interfere with the triptych peptides as they are generally around the size of two kilo Daltons. And I've included this image here just to see it's, it's a very uh, clear um, example of how much um, gunk is cleared from these samples, because you can see that this, the actual filter itself is completely brown and all this material is collecting at the bottom. So this is kind of not visible until they're precipitated out. So this is not what you want to hand to um, somebody operating a mass spec. Uh, following then the, the filtration step, um, peptides are purified. This is done with a desalting using C18 columns. And this just basically gives high purity peptides, which I can then hand over and they can be loaded onto the mass spec. So moving into metaproteomics, um, for anyone that may have heard a talk from me in the past, um, I've kind of gone into detail into the, the kind of the aspect of metaproteomics. Uh, so I'm going to do that again here today in, in a way that people might actually gain some interest in this technology um, for, and for those who may not have heard of it. So there's different ways to look at the microbiome. You can begin with the sim simple uh, microscopy. That's actually very beneficial and it's really encouraged because uh, if you're trying to consider what your database needs to consist of when you go to um, map these spectra to um, different proteomes, it's a good idea to actually see what's in the samples. So uh, you might see structures that relate to uh, a bacteriophage and now you know you need phages in your, um, in your database. So it's a good first step. Um, moving on to the more well-known metagenome sequencing, obviously a great method. You get high um, taxonomic uh, assignment, you get a function that you can predict um, and similar to metatranscriptomics. But with metaproteomics, you get these things, but you additionally just get an overall view of activity within the microbiome that you just can't really get from DNA or even from RNA. RNA can get halfway there, but um, it's very difficult to map uh, metatranscriptome to a metaproteome and get a huge amount of crossover. So metaproteomics is just a technology that really adds a new omic dimension to how we can study and uh, analyze microbiomes. Question. Yes. Is it is it been compared whether metagenomics and metaproteomics offer equivalent resolution on taxonomy and function? Metagenomics, as it stands, is better for resolution of taxonomy. Um, for a couple of reasons, one being that it's just more well established. Um, it's a more direct method. The resolution of a metagenome versus like an amplicon sequencing experiment is always going to be lower. Mm -hmm. Amplicon sequencing is just going to be the most direct way yeah. to find out what's in the sample. Um, and like that, even when it comes to the bioinformatics, it's 
there's just workflows that are better established for metagenomics. Metaproteomics really only begun, the first paper was 2004. So it's really only 15, I don't know what year it is, but about 15 years um, old at this point. And only in the past, maybe five years, it's kind of taken off more. But even as it stands, it's really more directed at human microbiome and kind of more models like that. Uh, environmental soil is gaining traction, but it's still in its infancy, effectively. Um, and yeah, that, this, this kind of figure at the side kind of explains that again, just uh, taxonomy is where metaproteomics um, can probably have more of a struggle. Um, and that's more so down to how we actually, um, the algorithms we use to assign taxonomy. Um, so just to give it a bit of a definition, so it's interrogation of the whole protein complement of microbial communities. It gives you an idea of functional expression at the moment in time that you collect your sample. And it, um, it gives an idea of actual activity versus potential activity within a microbiome. Um, it does, however, come with some major challenges. Uh, DNA can be amplified, proteins cannot. So there's a, there's a throughput issue with proteomics. Um, there's a low multiplexing issue as well, because obviously with DNA sequencing, you can parallel uh, sequencing runs, but a mass spec is kind of a single uh, stream. Um, and then the depth of information, low taxonomic complexity does kind of translate to a trickier metaproteomic experiment. And then the effort that you put into your mass spectrometry also dictates the outcome of the experiment in a, in a major way. Uh, without going into too much detail of the uh, mass spec facilities, the hope score facility we use here on campus, um, this is just a uh, detail of, of what I actually use. Uh, Tanya's in the audience, so I hope none of that's incorrect. Um, and the data acquisition is done over a gradient of two hours, so about 90 minutes of the actual data collection is done. Once the uh, mass spec runs are finished, uh, I use something called the metaproteome analyzer to analyze uh, what's actually uh, in what, what those spectra correspond to, uh, which is the workshop I attended. <laughs> and, um, Using the metaproteomic analyzer, it's it's a metaproteome analyzer. It's just a tool that kind of houses multiple different ways to uh, analyze different aspects of metaproteomics. Um, one of the big benefits of the MPA is that it has a kind of tailored ways to perform its searches. It'll perform a search on an indexed Uniprot database, and then it'll search uh, what the outcome of that database again, and it'll pull out kind of uh, the most um, uh, high confidence results from that. If you go to use these search engines independently, which I have attempted, uh, the algorithms are just, they really struggle with large pro uh, meta proteome databases. Um, so there's a lot of kind of work to do in terms of uh, database building in that sense. Um, the strategy for false discovery rate is based on a target decoy method. Uh, so basically uh, decoy sequences are made in reverse of all the uh, proteins within a database. And then that's how you kind of assign the false discovery rate based on mappings to your decoys. Um, and then one of the mo most interesting and useful features of the metaproteome analyzer is it, it creates metaproteins. And I'll kind of go into more detail on what they are. So normally with a proteomics experiment, you're only typically looking at a singular genome or a reference proteome. And um, that, that is kind of assigned to the Occam's razor, where if uh, something is non-unique, it's effectively discarded. So we have a situation here where there's unique peptides that are being mapped to a particular protein. That's great, that's a, that's a hit. Um, if we have non-unique peptides, but they uh, occur at different distances within our protein, still unique, and that's considered, um, that's considered into a group. And we're using peptide, pep, peptide spec, spectral matches to do this. So these are all the PSMs. And um, uh, that works for a proteomics experiment. That doesn't work for metaproteomics because obviously you're going to expect to see the same almost near identical proteins from similar species within a microbiome. So if we just consider one, then we're kind of excluding a lot of potential uh, taxa in that kind of analysis. Um, so it doesn't use, it uses an uh, anti Occam's razor uh, uh, algorithm effectively for looking at these and it, it groups proteins based on metaproteins where this kind of occurrence uh, happens. So as I mentioned, database is the real struggle when it comes to metaproteomics. Um, there's four different ways you can kind of uh, construct or use a database. So there's matched metagenomes. So metagenomics and metaproteomics at the moment are pretty dependent upon one another, not completely. Um, but for a really uh, robust microbiome 
experiment and match metagenome is really the best way to go. Um, that's even more so applicable when it comes to soil. Um, to give an example, when we have a total spectrum, um, so like a reference database in, the, in a human gut model, you might get a mapping of, in a grade experiment, up to 50% of your spectral will map. In a soil experiment, it could be 2%, it could be 5%. Um, so it's not unusual for only 1% of your spectra to actually map to what you provide. Um, an unmatched metagenome is just where you take similar studies to what you're researching, and then you use those metagenomes, you download them, and that's your reference database. So that also works. There's not a lot of soil uh, experiments that I can use, and in particular with casing, it's a bit more niche. Um, the unrestricted reference database is kind of what I've used for some of the results I'll show today. Um, and that's just using all Uniprot, all Swissprot. And um, so that's, that works. So if you have something like the MPA, uh, but obviously the resolution is going to kind of decrease as the um, database becomes less specific. And then the restricted reference database. So this is something I attempted, but the search engines that I've been using just do not handle databases of this size well. This table down here is kind of a, an idea of what you might find in casing when it comes to bacteria and fungi. Um, and this is the databases I created. The full casing database had over 92 million proteins. Ridiculous, it's never gonna work. Fungi, it had over 13 million. Better, but it's actually still too large. Bacteria, after it being slimmed, uh, 36, over 36 million protein sequences. I used the MPA to slim down the, pro the bacterial database. So where I saw a singular order within a phyla or a phylum, um, I uh, slimmed it down to just that order. And if I saw multiple orders uh, in results uh, for, for a given phylum, uh, I just kept the phylum as it was. So the likes of proteobacteria and firmcuties are gonna get a big diversity of taxa within these phyla. So that would not be slimmed, still didn't work. So um, I'm working with the developer of the MPA at the moment, um, and we're hoping to uh, create a tailored database Pretty much the same thing I've already created, but it's going to be indexed in a way that it can actually be built into the MPA for my use and maybe other people's use. So uh, hopefully in the near future, that can uh, be a reality. So then just moving on to some results. So following uh, some of the work uh, with the Metaproteome Analyzer, um, I'm going to just, it's still a work in progress. I'm still kind of analyzing the data. I'm still trying to overcome the database issue. Um, but I can represent some, some of the sample points. So this is the day zero standard versus passage casing. And just from a general overview, um, pie charts are probably not the best way to represent this. Um, we can see that there's a clear difference in the taxa between these two materials, which is to be expected. Um, there seems to be a lot more of ascom mycota uh, within the passage material. And as well as that, the facility mycota um, is actually larger in this size too, uh, which makes sense because you expect to see more agaricus by spores proteins in this kind of microbiome. Um, some of the smaller uh, parts, uh, sects of the pie chart um, are a little bit um, misleading because um, a lot of this information would have originally contained chordata, which is coming from me, operators, and just kind of false assignments. So that's been filtered out, but obviously uh, filtering out uh, the largest part will kind of skew the rest. Um, but this, this is kind of an overview that I get once we exclude any core data. We can also use um, heat maps uh, to look at, at this information, but obviously you can see there's uh, a lot of um, function and taxonomy to, to uh, sift through. So it's not the best way to look at it, but it's a nice way to kind of represent this is the metaproteome from two different samples. So this is the standard material and the passage material. And this is um, each of these tiles uh, relates to uh, metaproteins and metaprotein counts. Um, and then these are assigned using a, a, a false discovery rate of uh, 5%. And um, as I mentioned, it's kind of an unclear way to look at some of this information. So just if we zoom in a little bit. Uh, so the, this relates to the pie charts that I already showed. Um, but you can see here how chordata are really overrepresented in these samples. A lot of this will be a true representation because um, there will be a lot of, um, between the MRC and handling of material, there will be a lot of uh, human protein in there. So a lot of keratins will be found in this. And then with the trypsin as well, that comes from a mammalian source. So uh, this is where chordata is represented. This will obviously get filtered out when this data is processed um, more uh, uh, more. So um, as well as that, we, we see a high representation for proteobacteria in both the standard and the passage material. But interestingly, a lot of the most abundant metaproteins in the passage material actually don't have uh, an assignment. They have function, but it's unknown what phyla they come from. 
uh, this will be greatly helped with a metagenome. Uh, so it's interesting to see that there's proteins that um, there's not an assignment for, but hopefully some of those gaps will be filled once we have uh, DNA. Um, and then as well as that, you get a lot of representation of Ascomycota as well in both these samples. Um, and then a lot of different uh, uh, functions found within these. So there's a lot of transcription, protein turnover, glycolysis. Uh, some of the more uh, unusual uh, functions are probably more related to the coronata that you see. Mm -hmm. What's the extent of the unknown and the standard? Is there, is there a category for that? So this is ranked by how many metaproteins there are. So the standard actually had better um, functional classification. Yeah. Um, for what reason, I'm not sure, but you can still see it. it's still quite a lot in the uh, standard material, but it's definitely higher in the passage material. Um, there's no answer yet uh, as to why that is. I think with um, a metagenome that will, that will um, make that more clear. I don't think I mentioned this, but we are actually doing metagenomics. And um, so I'm currently, I have samples sent off for sequencing at the moment. So in the next couple of months, I will be mapping these results to a metagenome. Chord plots are probably a better way to represent uh, taxonomy and function. But again, there's a lot of information within these. Um, this is the same again for the heat map, only instead of looking at pretty much everything, I try to filter it down to the five most abundant uh, phyla. Um, and where it's not a phylum, it's just because, uh, so for the likes of bacteria here, there's no uh, phylum uh, classification. So uh, where the, the highest level of classification you'll see in this core plot is for phyla. Um, and again, you're just, you're getting some of the similar players that ask in my code, but this, um, this is where you can see that a lot of the functions for different phyla are either unknown or they might be related to something like translation or biogenesis, protein turnover. There's a lot of representation for a stress response in some of these samples. Um, so as we get um, better classifications, we'll be able to take each individual function and map it to uh, different phyla. So we're definitely inter interested in firm cuties. We're definitely interested in looking at uh, proteobacteria, uh, which are better represented, I think, here. Yeah, um, better represented here and here. Um, so we know that proteobacteria are an important component uh, of uh, the fructification process. And this is kind of the first time we can really infer some kind of function as to what these uh, microbial communities are actually doing within the microbiome. But this is still a work in progress and there's a lot of uh, data analysis yet to be done. Um, if we just take out some of the highest uh, levels of metaproteins across the different samples, so. And this is just kind of like the beginning of the crop, kind of a midway point in the crop and the very end. What's interesting is there's definitely a clear difference, I think I've already demonstrated, between the standard and the passage material um, as early as day zero. Um, some functions that are um, important relating to uh, anything got to do with uh, uh, reproduction. And the just different uh, transport mechanisms, carbohydrate metabolism. Um, these differences are still seen as the crop progresses. So this is an interesting aspect because there's a potential that the microbiome tends to kind of um, converge as the crop goes on. But in terms of function, there's definitely a distinction as we move along the crop in terms of uh, um, uh, biological processes. Uh, what's interesting is towards the end of the crop, these biological processes do converge more, but there is still a difference between the two. So uh, what's, hap what's happening functionally tends to be more diverse at an area point in the crop. So just to kind of wrap up um, some of the uh, slides I've shown. So metaproteomics um, definitely is an interesting uh, field of study in terms of looking at the mushroom <laughs> devome. Um, the devome of agaricus is a, could be potentially a nice model for something like a developmental microbiome study. Um, agaricus by spores in itself as a microorganism. Uh, it's a controlled unit uh, in-house. You can control a lot of parameters that you just don't get um, as tight control in certain other crops. Uh, so it's a nice way to kind of analyze the impacts of uh, passaging these materials and manipulating the microbiome. So it might be a nice model by the end of this project for uh, something like a DEVO. Um, we definitely see that passaging stimulates primordial formation. Um, and as well as uh, primordial formation, we see that there is a dynamism when it comes to uh, crop disease. So positive for bacteria and potentially negative for uh, fungi in terms of uh, commercial outcomes. Uh, 
database is definitely the biggest challenge uh, when it comes to metaproteomics um, and it's something I'm always trying to work with now. I've crashed many servers, I've created many databases that haven't worked, um, but with the MPA this is kind of becoming more manageable um, and then hopefully in the next couple of months when it, we have um, metagenome to use as mapping, this will really resolve a lot of the issues um, that I'm currently having. So some, some early studies uh, show that there's a distinct structural and functional difference between passage and casing or between uh, passage and standard casings. Um, and this is to be expected because you see a much different phenotype between the two crops. Um, but it's encouraging in terms of the end goal of pot uh, potentially kind of intentionally inoculating casing um, for these different important communities. And a lot more data processing is still to be done. So maybe at the next seminar series, I'll have kind of all the samples laid out and a much better resolution on what's actually happening within these microbiomes. Um, but there's there's definitely an interesting case to be made for uh, how the developmental microbiome is being influenced. So I just want to thank the DBOM team, my PIs, Professor Kevin Hockett, John Pecky, and Carly Bull. Um, a big thanks to Fabricio as well and our undergrad, uh, Isaka Dietz Massey or Izzy. Um, we spend a lot of time in the MRC and these kind of experiments do take a lot of uh, labor. I um, want to thank Ed Kaiser as well for his help at the MRC and Chad. Uh, Rachel Richardson helped out with um, a lot of the uh, blanch work. And then uh, Tatiana Laramore uh, from the core proteomics facilities here uh, on campus for working with me. And thank you all for listening. Good, thanks for, for that great talk. Uh, we're gonna start with questions, but as for tradition, we ask the first question to come from a student or a postdoc for me. So, questions? Yes. Um, I have no ideas about the method of uh, proteome, so mm -hmm. maybe this is a very basic question. How accurate on those peptide identification? Like, if I think about the metagenomics, we have some sequence errors or something like that can be happening. What is the case in the um the protein, like method protein mix? Uh, when it comes to something like a soil um sample, it's very hard to kind of pinpoint what represents a good sample match. With the spectra, I actually do look at individual protein results when it, uh, within the MPA. So you can look at a spectrum. And you can see, uh, I, I know I'm familiar with what a good spectrum looks like. So you'll normally get a high peak for a precursor ion. Um, and then that's followed by smaller peaks. So when that, that ion is uh, collided and broken apart within uh, the mass spec. Um, and then what will happen is you'll get uh, spectrum matches for each of those ions following the precursor ion. And um, some of these cases you'll see, you might get a singular ion match. That's a bad kind of result. Then you might look at the sequence coverage of the protein that it's been assigned to. Um, so if you get very low coverage, very low pep unique peptides, and then a really poor ion matching within the spectrum, that's an, that's an idea of a bad result. All the results I showed here today, they've been kind of processed with a strict FDR. Um, I use a 5% FDR. Um, if I was doing a human gut microbiome experiment, I'd probably make that 2%. Um, but with soil, it's just more challenging. So you kind of loosen things up a little bit. And then um, following the actual results that I showed, that's that's processed again with another FDR. So there's a lot of different aspects that dictates a good sample outcome, even from the bench all the way to the bioinformatics and then to the final results. There's a lot of screening and there's a lot of different things that occur, but uh, it's it's messy work. Okay. Yeah, so uh, thank you for Really great talk, Owen. This is really fascinating stuff. Um, I'm curious about this Cordata result where you see a lot of things mapping to Cordata. Certainly there could be human or or other mammalian stuff in there from the trypsin and handling and all of that. But I'm also wondering if maybe there's like classification problem where all those databases are just so much better resolved. Do you think there's a proportion of those results that are actually microbial? They're just kind of mapping somewhere where there is a hit and that happens to be in Cordata? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Again, coming back to that, the idea of screening, when, when I look at the results and the outcomes, um, I'm looking at keratin. So a keratin, it's very likely it's from me or from somebody else. Um, when it comes to the assignment of taxa and then function, mammalia is way more represented than a lot of these microorganisms. So it's definitely a case that 
um, some of these mappings will actually be true results, but they'll just be assigned to Cordata um, uh, erroneously. I'm looking into it, but I don't know if I can correct that with the metagenome. There might be a way to kind of start first with the metagenome and then try and map as opposed to correcting with the metagenome afterwards, if that makes sense. Um, I don't know if a, a kind of a post-hoc metagenome correction will work um, at the point. I think it might only look at the unknowns, but there might be a way to do an experiment where use the metagenome first and then complement that with the metaproteomics and then see, do you still get the same level of Cordata being assigned? That's probably one way to do it. But yeah, it's just one of these kind of incidences where uh, it's a new field and most people are working with mice, human, feces, things like that. So there's going to be a lot more representation for the likes of mammalia. Okay. Uh, how accurate would you say that those taxonomic profilings are? Because you're looking at protein mm -hmm. and you know there's like redundancy of function and stuff. So when you're assigning taxonomy from a protein, um, how would you just, uh, how would you like say that the accuracy is? Mm -hmm. It's a big question. Um, what I will say is um, I'm not very familiar. I haven't processed my own work with uh, metagenomics, but when it comes to proteomics, you're using unique peptides and you're using it kind of to go from spectra to uh, peptide to protein is a pretty like distinct process, if that makes sense. So finding a distinct peptide within a group is a very, it's actually probably more accurate than DNA because DNA, there's a lot of redundancy and there's different kind of outcomes, obviously for uh, an, uh, an exon. Um, but with a protein assignment, it's actually a lot more succinct in the sense that you're looking at this uh, unique peptides when you're making those. So when you get a level where it's not a meta protein, it's just protein, I would be pretty confident with it. But again, it's all about database. If your database is poor, you're more likely to get false positives, even after all your FDR screenings. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's the, the answer. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for this talk. I, I don't do a lot of metro programming, but I would like to. So I was wondering uh, in your data, maybe it's a bit early if you, I don't know what is the green mold, if it's a fungi or something else, but if you found it, or, or even if you found your main crop mushroom, uh, and like if you can see some differences. I was wondering actually about the extraction yield as well. Like, um, you know, if those things are not in there, like, is it because you lost them somewhere? Or because in terms of biomass, at least in some of your sample, it looks like, you know, they are blooming or they should be like very abundant. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess there are multiple questions in that question, but yeah, no, uh, I think it's a it's a good point to raise. Um, extraction, obviously, I think it's a bit of a cliche to say this, but I think the most important part of any experiment is the very first, the, literally the cell lysis. So if you don't do a, an effective cell lysis or you don't effectively collect proteins from your matrix, it's going to impact the whole way down the experiment for obvious reasons. Um, the methods that are used tend to be like the fact that I'm boiling and I'm, I'm using so a lot of people use sonication, different things like that. They're kind of tried and tested ways to get as many proteins out of sample as possible. Um, but within that, then you could, you could obviously still miss something if it's a really low abundance. Um, proteins can have a level of stability because these are obviously flash frozen on the spot. They're freeze dried. There's a level of stability and sample care that's taken to kind of maximize protein yield. Proteins are easier to work with as well. Uh, they don't degrade as easily as DNA. And um, so there is a level of uh, security in, in terms of protein stability, but obviously that's a generalization for something that's a very big, like wide uh, topic. Um, so you basically have to pick the best methods to extract the proteins as possible. And the method I chose, a lot of alterations were made just purely from seeing where people made mistakes in the past. Um, I'm considering moving over to more of a phenol extraction because it's just completely destructive. Uh, I use something that's a bit more, it's a uh, mass spec friendly, but it's still quite destructive, but it's, it's more tailored towards um, not destroying the mass spec and kind of gathering. It's, it's as general as it could possibly be, but actually um, from a workshop I recently attended, I could see where something like phenol, which is just completely destructive, might be the way to go when it comes to something as difficult as casing to extract from.
Um, there is somebody in the workshop I was in who was extracting from uh, horse feed from the horse's stomach. Um, they, would they would literally, you know, kill the horse and take the stomach contents out and then map from the, the throat to the stomach to the, to the feces. And um, that was a huge problem for him as well, because there's obviously a lot of lignans and different things in those samples to work with. So it's, it's the most common uh, problem probably in normal proteomics, how to extract proteins from really complex samples. Sorry, if I think sure, first. <laughs> Good question. Great talk. So, if you had all the money in the world and time, Who says I doesn't. <laughs> um, I was wondering. This is the question that has to do with assigning taxonomy again with mm -hmm. the proteomics. So, have you thought about, or has anybody sort of done metagenomic studies with the same samples and then tried to validate what they found to the proteomic taxonomy? And sort of just using managing, them, yeah. Managing uh, yeah, I mean it's a common thing to do, yeah. um, particularly in environmental samples. Mm -hmm. um, I would say metagenomics uh, already has a relatively low resolution. Um, I don't know how often it's done with Ampicon sequencing because then it's effectively you're doing the unrestricted reference database thing again, where you can just download. You, you know what I mean? Like you just download uh, something. Um, there's definitely um, correction of metaproteomics is really effective with metagenomics, but I don't know, has there been a huge mm -hmm. amount of uh, trying to see how much they intersect, like whether you can get full coverage or not. Um, but as well as that, there are certain proteins that you will find that metagenomics won't capture as well. So it's not always the case that they're, they're, the studies are poorly um, overlapping. It could be a case that there might be proteins that you're not capturing in a metagenome. Right. I mean, it would be interesting if you had that sort of the core, the overlap to then create a reference database based on that mm -hmm. and then yeah. work downstream. But. Yeah, no, and it's, yeah, that's something that is done as well. Yeah, I think the, the method going forward for me would be to restrict, instead of doing all of Uniprop, restrict it down to something that's more representative of casing and then correcting with metagenomics. I think that's probably the best that can be done. And that's what I aim to do. But if I had all the money in the world, I'd just do many many more mass spectrums <laughs> <laughs> so along those lines uh so how much of a coverage do you expect to recover from your, uh i can't that answer that yet because i don't truly know how many unknowns i have yes but you might go from you, you i've seen some coverages as poor as 0.5 percent yes. as high as two to three i've gotten some decent results uh, in terms of spectral mapping um but it's skewed by the database sometimes too um so you're going to get one percent maybe in the database that's non-specific but i that, i could bring that up to 20 percent with something more specific so how much you could correct for it depends on that initial coverage which is dependent on the database so i'm not answering your question okay all right <laughs> and we had that question already yes sorry uh, do you think that the results here could translate over to other edible mushrooms like lion's mane or oyster mushrooms uh e yes casing we're only like casing is really button mushroom specific um i think um but um it would translate over in the sense that there's an experiment that i'm working on at the moment where i'm actually doing pro just typical proteomics on mushroom caps but i'm doing it in a way that will be open for metaproteomics so you can apply metaproteomics to the caps themselves and you can effectively map from the substrate to the cap what uh bacteria and fungi might be on top of the cap itself, which isn't typically done. Uh, so there might be overlap in terms of like what's on caps, but the starting substrate is different depending on the mushroom you're growing and may, might be potentially more transferable in an environmental setting. But uh, yeah, it's very specific to what different mushrooms and where, what kind of systems are being grown in. So um, the team's really lucky to have you on on, on, on this project because your comparisons and contrast throughout the work are really helpful for evaluation. So it's nice work. I tend to think about metaproteomics as a candidate protein searching tool for a particular function, or if I had a protein in mind, I want to know if it's present. I don't tend to think of it as community profiling. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering from what you've learned, do you think that that is a fair way to draw a rough line through it or am um, I missing something? Yeah, I don't think we're at the point that we could just do metaproteomics and then confidently say this, this is the full uh, taxonomic distribution within my microbiome. I don't think it's there yet. 
Um, I think it could get there with probably tools and tools that can do searches more succinctly and obviously with mass, mass specs themselves becoming higher resolution. Um, uh, each year it's a bit like DNA sequencing, the, the actual platforms that perform the sequencing are always improving and that's kind of increasing. So I think it'll come with those two things, um, but really it's, they're rethinking how we even consider the mapping in the first place. So the false discovery rate, that's based on a, on a, um, a reverse decoy database, but you know, reversing a sequence and counting that as the false hit is not really, in my opinion, the most accurate way to assign a false positive. So I think when those things get improved as well, it'll all just keep getting more and more robust and powerful. Um, but for now, I do think definitely for environmental and soil type samples, we, we do need metagenomes. Maybe in the human gut microbiome sample, uh, metaproteomics might be enough for now. Yeah. Yeah. So we got to start somewhere. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. I think there was a question over here. Okay. Any other questions? All right then. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.